Have you ever played the board game Clue? You're trying to figure out who the murderer is and how or where he or she did it in a mansion. As you walk into each room, you're given a new clue. Then you make a suggestion. If no one has evidence to prove you wrong, then you make an accusation. If you're right, you win the game. If you're not, you lose and are out. A year and a half ago, producer Chris Pinto interviewed me outside Nashville. At that time, I didn't have a 50th of the information I have now regarding Sinaiticus, Tischendorf, Manly, P. Hall, nor did I have high-resolution photos of Sinaiticus and Vaticanus or the actual facsimiles of them, thanks to brother Jack McElroy. And most of what I've shown you since December 2015 has been brand new information to me as I have learned, received, or figured it out. You have had a front row seat to my discovery process. Some of you have asked about my theories. Up until now, I've tried to relate facts, but I've not put them together publicly into theories. What is the Sinaiticus really? Where did it come from? And why is the Roman Catholic Church suddenly interested in the Alexandrian Greek texts before it was only interested in the Roman Catholic Latin Vulgate? Why did the Catholic leadership start giving accolades and commendations to Greek textual critics starting in the 1800s? And finally, where's it all heading? In other words, what is the big picture? If you're interested, I will now put facts and evidence that lead toward an accusation. This is part one, the evidence. Part two will be my theory. Ready to play Clue with me? Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. In April of 2015, I pieced together the writings by occultist Manly P. Hall for Vlog 113, Why the NWO Hates the KJV. But a few months later, some words he had said caught my eye. He wrote these words for his article in spring of 1944. Quote, to make things right, we will have to undo much that is cherished error. The problem of revising the Bible shows how difficult it is to do this. For the last hundred years, we've been trying to get out an edition of the Bible that is reasonably correct, but nobody wants it. What is wanted is the good old King James Version, every jot and tittle of it because most people are convinced that God dictated the Bible to King James in English. Suddenly it hit me. 1944? 100 years earlier was 1844, and the only Bible version-related event was the so-called discovery of the Sinaiticus, starting in 1844. I showed how I got to this point in Vlog 147, KJV, Sinaiticus, and the NWO. Was the Sinaiticus important? And who was this we that Hall talked about anyway? They weren't Bible-believing Christians. It seemed he hated them. They were the problem to be solved. And since he was a high-level occultist, with connections to major political figures like 33rd degree Masonic President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, it seems we were some pretty high up people. Hall believed only two things stopped the New World Order before it started, the King James Bible and the thinking of the people. You take out one, the King James, and the other, the thinking of the people goes with it. Please let that sit in, sink in, don't let go of your King James for anyone. Not even a turncoat former King James believing professor or preacher. Hall had two solutions to get the NWO ball rolling. 
The first was indoctrinating the people like the Nazis did, start in kindergarten teaching psychology and mental and emotional tolerance. Sound like today? The second was doing whatever had to be done to get people to let go of their belief in every jot and tittle of the King James Bible. He figured it could be done in five generations. We're in generation four, and already most of what Hall wanted has been done almost to the letter. The year before this, in December 2014, I made Vlog 92, This Is Not a Conspiracy Theory. I showed how former head of Planned Parenthood, Richard Day, revealed many plans of a group he belonged to called The Order. Their big plan included lots of social change that has already happened to us by the second decade of the 21st century. But he also said they had to rewrite the Bible, quote, to fit the new religion, end quote, changing the meanings of words, one word at a time. Soon the Bible would become flexible enough to embrace that new world religion. So the King James Bible has been on a lot of people's hit lists. And the Sinaiticus, it turns out, was the Greek Codex, big book, that set the ball rolling against the King James and toward the Alexandrian stream of manuscripts. This includes Codex Vaticanus, housed at the Vatican, of course. So, I turned my focus onto the Sinaiticus. Researcher Stephen Avery had showed me actual photographs of Sinaiticus in March 2014. He was willing to consider the idea that a guy named Constantine Simonides had actually put together the Codex Sinaiticus around 1840. Chris Pinto had fronted that theory in his Bible video, Tears Among the Wheat. I told Stephen that I had a, quote, very, very, very hard time believing that Constantine Simonides, a peddler of what he said were ancient manuscripts, had anything to do with the Codex Sinaiticus. Even if Sinaiticus were not an ancient codex, I believed Scrivener and others who said Simonides was a con man. It seemed he kept finding the most gullible people and sold many counterfeits to him or her, but it seemed he could sell something even to the hardened critics. They became convinced that the others may be faked, but mine is genuine. The only problem was every expert disagreed on which one was the genuine one. As I saw it, Simonides did both short and long cons. Long cons take longer to develop. Sometimes it involves a third party who sells to or discovers something for the target guy. Then later, Simonides would show up and claim he could check authenticity on anything. And the target would naturally show that artifact even if he didn't know a paper was carefully rolled up or hidden inside it then voila, Simonides would discover it and validate it, or he'd suddenly say, you have a priceless artifact. And then the guy, not seeing any connection between the first guy and him, would trust Simonides to sell him other ancient stuff. So I didn't believe Simonides' story of assembling the codex, now called Sinaiticus, as a gift for the Tsar of Russia when he was a late teen. Simonides was a late teen. The story went that it was a gift because the Tsar was the guy who financed the monastery, so it's good to keep him happy. Well, okay, that much of the story was true. But he also said that Tischendorf was either deceived or a liar. I had no reason to doubt Konstantin Tischendorf, who claimed that in 1844 he saved a bunch of sheets headed for the fireplace to keep the monks warm. I even wrote it in my book. Then, years later in 1859, a monk gave him hundreds more sheets of this same Greek Bible that he soon called Codex Sinaiticus. 
I believed that story for over 30 years. So did every professor I ever spoke to. I'd need good reason not to believe Tischendorf's story with his sterling reputation. So now I was back to square one. I had reasons to focus on Sinaiticus, not Simonides. I needed solid facts. So, fact number one, someone darkened Sinaiticus. Stephen Avery showed me CodexSinaiticus.org where I could actually see high quality photographs of Sinaiticus for the first time. I was looking to see if someone whitened the 43 sheets of animal skin that Tischendorf brought from St. Catherine's Monastery in the Egyptian peninsula to Leipzig. This was called the Codex Frederico Augustanus, or CFA. After hours of looking, I could see that the CFA wasn't lightened. The rest of the pages were darkened. Someone had spilled tea or coffee or something and spread it on the pages. Then I found out that a Russian religious official, Porfiry Uspensky, the very next year, 1845, saw all the rest of what we call Sinaiticus and said it was all white. The dates given make it clear. The majority of Sinaiticus was darkened sometime after 1850, Uspensky's last visit, and before 1860 when people began to see it in Russia. But if it were between 1850 and 1860, Tischendorf would have known it was changed and should have cried foul if he was innocent. That means either Tischendorf knew who did it, or he was an accomplice, or Tischendorf darkened Sinaiticus. Tischendorf no longer had a sterling reputation with me. Then came the next bombshell. Fact number two. Tischendorf lied about how he got the Sinaiticus. In the Bible Hunter, a few things became clear. One, parchment doesn't burn nicely, it smolders and stinks. Two, the basket for burning parchments was actually a standard way of storing them. Three, that means the whole conversation Tischendorf had with the librarian was a lie since it involves one and two. Four, that also means that the reason Tischendorf gave for bringing home the 43 sheets of Sinaiticus was also a lie. Now I have no idea why or how he brought them to Saxony. All I knew for sure was that my 30 years of believing Tischendorf were in flames. He was a liar and a con and a counterfeiter because it turns out that the only reason for darkening or yellowing pages was to make them look older than they were, usually to sell them, since ancient manuscripts were extremely popular. It is even said that monks engaged in counterfeiting for money for their monasteries. Fact number three. Sinaiticus is not even a trustworthy copy. It's more like a draft paper before the rewrite. Now it's time to look more carefully, more closely at the Sinaiticus facsimile sent by Jack McElroy. What I found astounded me. On a single page, the copyist managed to skip from 1 Chronicles 19.17 to Ezra 9.9. 9. It was done by the one called Scribe A, and he didn't miss a beat. See? Just went around right like that. So it was clear he was copying something. Got to the bottom of one sheet, and then looked at another sheet, totally out of order. Then on the very same line, he kept copying. That makes it look like he wasn't reading what he was copying, or he would have seen the radical difference. This made me think that there were multiple source documents put together, and then they were being rapidly copied, maybe in a rush. If they'd been identical, the skip wouldn't have happened in the middle of the column. It would have been at the bottom of the page. So something that didn't have four columns was copied onto something that did have four columns. 
Oh, and Sinaiticus is about the only manuscript of the Bible in four columns. Alexandrinus is in two columns. Vaticanus is in three columns. Only Sinaiticus is in four columns. So whatever the scribe copied from was not the same. And it was probably in less than four columns. But the fact that this wasn't proofread and such a massive glaring mistake was made tells me this wasn't a final copy. It was maybe a draft. Maybe the people were calligraphers but couldn't actually read Greek. Or maybe a proofreader who could read Greek forgot to check this one before it was bound and made into a book. In fact, after this page, the corrector does start correcting again, so that is a possibility. This shot the idea that either one, the scribes were the brilliant people I was always told, or two, that the Sinaiticus was a reliable copy of the scriptures, even of the Alexandrian screen. Fact number four. Sinaiticus sections were colored differently. Fellow researcher Mark Mickey and I downloaded high-resolution photos of Sinaiticus. When I created a collage of all 822 pages together, it became clear that whoever colored Sinaiticus did it in stages. I've enhanced the colors to show you in a photo. The white is the CFA. Exactly the pages that Tischendorf took to Saxony. Then there's a certain color to the rest of the Old Testament. Then there's a third group, color group, in the New Testament. It's unmistakable. But the people who made the facsimile of Sinaiticus said they made sensitive adjustments to the color, and voila, all those differences disappeared. The facsimiles do not show you the real colors. They even make the white pages of the CFA look just as dark as the rest. That means that someone in charge of printing the facsimile deliberately changed the colors so they would match. Why? Didn't they want people to see what I saw on codexsanieticus.org in plain sight? What were they afraid of? That led to even more questions. Fact 5. You can't tell by looking what is and isn't scripture. Modern scholars are inconsistent in picking which rewrites are scripture and which are not. There's scribbling and erasing and rewriting by multiple people. Then which one is scripture? How come in the Old Testament the extra writing is added to the text, but in the New Testament it's usually taken out of the text? It looks like Tischendorf just picked and chose a Bible with what he wanted in the text, not what God wants in the text. Which scribe gave us the true scripture? A, B, C, D. Which corrector fixed the mistakes right? A, B, C, D. How can you tell? We already know Tischendorf was a liar and a con. So how can we trust which words he decided to put in his specially typed up facsimile of Sinaiticus as the actual scripture? Answer, we can't. Fact number six. Some whole sections were changed. There are three sheets that when folded make four pages each that scribe D used to cancel out scribe A's mistakes. One of them is right where Mark ends and Luke begins. And the way the letters are squeezed together in Luke 1 and spread wide in Mark 14.54 to Mark 16.8, and then it just stops and leaves a big empty space, tells me that they're trying to cover for some empty space. Because then it just stops and leaves a big empty space, but it would have been bigger if they didn't spread out the letters. So it was made so it would not hold Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. That would make Sinaiticus, then, like Vaticanus, which was the only other Greek manuscript in the world that didn't have Mark 16, 9 to 20. That seems planned. 
Fact number seven. Sinaiticus could not possibly be one of the Bibles made for Emperor Constantine in the early 300s AD. According to his lapdog Eusebius, Constantine wanted 50 well-written Bibles. There is no way the Sinaiticus would even be accepted as a term paper, much less a Bible for the emperor. Fact 8. Sinaiticus had unique mistakes in place names. One was 1,200 miles off the mark, saying Gaul instead of Galatia. This mistake was only found in four lowercase manuscripts called minuscules and Codex Ephraimius Scriptus. One was seen by Tischendorf, and a second in the Codex was first deciphered by Tischendorf. Amazingly, some rare and unusual readings found in Sinaiticus do match manuscripts that Tischendorf either found or examined before Sinaiticus. Tischendorf used to tell about these journeys in magazines and journals and made a little money on the side that way. Could Tischendorf have had something to do with the Sinaiticus himself? Or rather, is it possible someone custom made a Bible that had things that Tischendorf was looking for. Fact 9. Sinaiticus can't be as old as they say it is. Porphyry Uspensky, who knew Alexandrian manuscripts, said it couldn't have been made before the 5th century, at least 446 AD, because of the space wasting four columns. But that would make Sinaiticus the same age as they say Alexandrinus is. It's 120 years plus after anything Constantine could have ordered, and it loses its authority as oldest and best. That also means Vaticanus, with its three columns, also couldn't be before 446 AD, so it can't be oldest and best either. Both would be the same as Alexandrinus. And in the Gospels, Alexandrinus is way more like the preserved text than like the Sinaiticus or Vaticanus. But there's more. By the 1800s, the oldest copy known that had some unique Latin readings that matched the Shepherd of Hermas at the end of the New Testament of Sinaiticus was the Latin Palatinus 150 in the Vatican Library from the late 1300s. But by 1855, people became aware of another one in Greek that had those unique readings. It came from a monastery in Mount Athos in northern Greece. The guy who came to sell it, or a copy of it, was none other than Constantine Simonides. So could Sinaiticus have simply back-translated the Latin of a late 1300s manuscript in the Vatican? Or could Simonides have had a part in putting together Hermas in the Sinaiticus? Either way, it doesn't look like the Sinaiticus was so ancient anymore. Now almost any date was possible. On another note, throughout the centuries, lots of copies of scripture were found, which were quite different from the Sinaiticus. But starting after the discovery of Sinaiticus, suddenly the vast majority of 20th century finds mostly matched Sinaiticus. Is that a coincidence? Or could counterfeiters have just gotten much better? Maybe trained to do just that and paid by, to do this by some big group with a big goal in mind. Fact 10. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus do not agree, so they could not be what Constantine wanted. Constantine wanted 50 Bibles, maybe, but he didn't want 50 different disagreeing Bibles. He just wanted multiple copies of one text. Fact 11. The text-critical scholars accepted Tischendorf's early date for Sinaiticus, no questions asked. In exchange, they got a text-critical gold mine with enough problems to employ them writing papers on Sinaiticus for the rest of their lives. So they, in turn, teach their students to doubt the true Bible and accept this counterfeit without question and reward them for these doubts. So one zombie scholar churned out another. A perfect example is Bart Ehrman, who believed his professors and doubted his God. 
Fact 11. Bible making is big business. Making Bibles makes well over a billion dollars a year. And it employs thousands upon thousands of people in all walks of life. If they were to admit right now that Sinaiticus is a fraud, or that there's only one line of preserved Bibles, many of them would be instantly out of a job. Even if they knew the truth, they have a vested interest in maintaining the lie to maintain their careers. Vlog 159 gives a glimpse at how big this issue truly is. Fact number 12. It is a bold-faced lie that, quote, None of these changes affect any basic doctrine of the Christian faith, as Jesuit-educated Norman Geisler and most professors have said. The resurrection of Christ is a basic doctrine. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus do not have Mark 16, 9-20. Then scholars claim that Mark was the first gospel, and that Mark wasn't written until Mark was dead in the 80s AD. Therefore, the resurrection appearances of Christ were added later and the bodily resurrection is treated as a later addition to Christianity. The ascension of Christ into heaven is a basic doctrine. But Luke 24, 51, about Jesus' ascension to the right hand of God, is also missing from Sinaiticus. This is the only verse in the Gospels that mentions Christ's ascension. So, if you trust the Sinaiticus and the text scholars, you may end up believing that the physical resurrection and the ascension into heaven are not original Christianity and may not have happened at all. The Sinaiticus, in two verses alone, destroys two of the most basic doctrines of Christianity. Two sections. 9 to 20 is one section. Fact number 13. All the top Greek scholars were fooled into trusting Category 1 Codex 2427 of Mark's Gospel until it was proved to be a fake. All the way through the Nestle's 27th edition, I have one right here, Greek New Testament, scholars accepted that 2427 Codex was a top-level Greek text even though they dated it in the 1300s. That's because it very largely backed up readings in Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. See this? This is all 2427. And it's all the way through the Gospel of Mark. 2427 is just of the Gospel of Mark. But in 1989, a Catholic chemistry professor, Mary Virginia Orna, proved it contained Prussian blue that wasn't used by the public until the 1720s. Bob Ross loved Prussian blue. And rare books expert Abigail Quant found that it also had synthetic ultramarine blue, dating it after 1820, and zinc white, dating it after 1825. Then, zinc sulfide which dated it after 1874. Not the 1300s anymore. But even the text wasn't ancient. Catholic Stephen Carlson, after much effort, checked the accidentally skipped lines of text and found they matched the lines of Philip Bootman's defective copy of Vaticanus, including the mistakes dated 1860. So it was a copy of a bad copy of Mark in Vaticanus, made sometime between 1874 and 1917. They never would have been so wrong if they'd looked for just two things. One, provenance, where it came from, what it was like, and the proof of it. Two, chain of custody, where did it go, who had it, and proof that it wasn't tampered with. Here's what's true about Sinaiticus. To this day, one, Sinaiticus has never been chemically tested. They canceled the April 2015 testing. Two, there is no master copy that has been found for Sinaiticus. Nothing looks like it anywhere. Three, it has no provenance. It just showed up 
in St. Catherine's Monastery about 1844. There's no record of its existence before 1844. Four, it has no chain of custody. And the only ones who claimed to witness Tischendorf after he got the Sinaiticus claimed that he aged the text to make it look older. And the guy who stated this was a friend of Constantine Simonides. I found out after this that monks told one manuscript explorer in 1815 that they had only three Bibles at St. Catherine's Monastery. Thirty years later, in 1845, when Porphyry Uspensky came, they said they had four Bibles. The fourth was the Sinaiticus. Fact number 14. Until 2004 to 2009, almost nobody saw actual pictures of more than a single page of Sinaiticus. That means almost everybody who told stories about Sinaiticus was trusting someone else who also had not seen Sinaiticus all the way back to 1862. That also means that everybody was trusting his or her professor to be telling the truth when nobody really knew what Sinaiticus even looked like. But trusting the professors meant doubting the King James. So thousands of students and pew sitters threw away their King James for a blind trust in a manuscript that not even their pastors or teachers had seen, much less examined. They threw away their path, their, threw away their faith for a mess, and I do mean a mess, of pottage. Go online at codexsinaiticus.org and see it for yourself while it's available. Psalm 118.8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Fact number 15. The Greek Old Testament Septuagint copied 48 words in a row out of Romans 3, 13 to 18 into Psalm 14.3, 13.3 in the so-called Septuagint. This means that the Septuagint, as we have it, could not be a B.C. document, but was made after Paul wrote Romans. And both Sinaiticus and Vaticanus have this, Paul's words, stuck back a thousand years into Psalm 14.3. Not only that, even Origen's Hexapla from at least the 230s A.D. admitted they do not belong. And so did the Catholic New American Bible through the 1970s. So, the Septuagint, as we have it today, in the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, was written after the New Testament, after 100 AD, not 285 BC. Fact number 16. There are no physical copies of a Septuagint that is earlier than the 4th century AD. The copies that exist have their origin in Origen, who trusted him and copied the fifth column of his hexapla. There are no more than a few lines here and there from any time earlier. You could not make a Septuagint out of them. And at the earliest, any copies of the Septuagint are from three centuries or more after Jesus, not before. So the only person in between is Origen. And he believes that God lied, the Bible contained lies, and that it was okay to lie to anyone that was not a close disciple. That does not give me confidence in the text that supposedly came from him. Remember, there is no Greek Septuagint anywhere. All we find in history are complete books with the Old Testament intermixed with various apocryphal writings and a New Testament and maybe extra writings all in the same book. Ultimately, Origen is the origin of modern doubting Bibles. Even though he didn't create the Septuagint, he passed on the one that people worked from, from then on. Fact number 17. Textual critics make three big mistakes. One, text critics judge scriptures by a rule. Quote, the harder reading is to be preferred, end quote that they didn't get from the scriptures, and that contradicts the way God works. Two, text critics forget the active presence of the devil, who wants people to have doubt, not faith, just like their critical text Bibles. Three, text critics forget the power of God, whose pattern is to give us his exact words, and who commands us not to add to them or take away from them. 
And there are two lessons to remember. One, I do not judge the scriptures. The scriptures judge me. Two, I do not change the scriptures. The scriptures change me. Fact number 17. There was no B.C. Septuagint. It was created before 50 A.D., probably by Philo of Alexandria, and the letter of Aristeus that claims it was made in the 280s B.C. is a fake. That is in vlogs 166 to 171. There's a playlist just for this topic. Fact number 18. The Apocrypha is being added to Bibles all over the world. Even though the King James translators gave seven good reasons for keeping them out of either the New or the Old Testament. Even new translations like the Common English Bible and the English Standard Version now have the Apocrypha available. Fact number 19. The Apocryphal books contain false doctrines that are taught by the Roman Catholic religion, but that contradict the actual scriptures. Tobit is a perfect case in point. It is wrong in history, chronology, geography, and it teaches dangerous doctrines that make man have to pay for his own sins, literally. Fact 20, the King James translators had a Vaticanus Alexandrinus type text. They used it for the uninspired Apocrypha, but rejected it for any actual scriptures. Brenton Septuagint, in 10 books of the Apocrypha, used accurately the KJV Apocrypha for his English translation instead of making his own, as he seems to have done for the rest of his books. These are the 20 facts I have learned since last December for the last six months. You are welcome to check the vlogs yourself for more information. This vlog was part one, the evidence. The next vlog, part two, will be my theory. God bless you and have a wonderful day.